Hello, uh, welcome to yet another um, edition of LinkedIn Live with ICF. My name is Magdalena Mock and I'm a CEO of uh, International Coaching Federation. And today I have a great pleasure of welcoming my good colleague and friend, Janet Harvey. Thank you for being with us, Janet. It's a pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. So Janet and I, we know each other for a long, long time. We probably don't want to confess to how many years. <laughs> um, and there are so many ways to introduce Janet. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you the official best-selling author, um, a great book, coaching and leadership book, Invite Change Lessons from 2020, the year of no return, uh, CEO of Invite Change, a coaching and human development organization, uh, Janet trained and coached leaders at Fortune 500 companies across six continents and has been doing that for a good 25 years. Uh, definitely a trendsetter and early adopter of creating a coach-centered workplace. Uh, Janet worked with global organizations and teams of leaders to transform and establish a resilient, high-performance culture and that sustains excellence through a generative coaching approach. Before that, Janet had a very successful career in, uh, well, Fortune what, 100 uh, companies. So, so certainly an amazing, amazing career. But... Uh, I had a pleasure of sharing a stage with Janet recently at the conference in Miami, where she offered a very different kind of introduction to herself. Janet, would you mind sharing it with us? Heavens no. Happy to do so. <clears throat> I am alchemical seer, sovereign, radiant, black pearl beauty, savvy, sassy, generous expression, riding on the winds of joy. As I achieve my evolutionary destiny, I live sovereign, using my gifts of joy and yes to life as the path for love manifest, the perfect balance of all forces. As I quiet into my faith in the vastness of the magnificent universe, I listen deeply to my soul and consciously Choose my answer. I am Vanguard, leader, author, speaker, coach, awakening the leader within so that all people choose the path of sovereignty and wholeness in their lives. I am Janet Harvey. Wow, I get little goosebumps. <laughs> what I wanted us to, to spend a little time, though, is this whole concept of sovereign. Um, I, I, I know that people may recognize the term, but may not necessarily apply it to their self. Could you, could you share with us a little bit more about your thinking about sovereignty and what it means for the individual in rather turbulent times right now? Yeah, individuals and collectives both, because in a lot of ways, people think of that term as being very uh, self-focused. Mm. And I don't hold it that way. And for the folks who really like to break down words, it's sov and reign. So sov is self and reign is ruler. Self-ruling. Mm. What we're really talking about with sovereignty, and, and it does get applied, of course, geopolitically, but in our work in human development, it's the journey interiorly to understand who we are and who we're always becoming. And accepting responsibility for the choices we make for how we relate to our lives. We can't always control our conditions and circumstances. Lord knows that's getting harder and harder as the days go <laughs> by. And the complexity means the one thing we do have some authority over is what is the way we make choices and decisions? Mm. How do we stay connected to our values? How do we bring our belief systems current? Because of course those are constructed. How do we recognize when bias and assumption, preferences and habits are overriding what actually serves in a relationship or a situation we find ourselves? Well, that's the practice of sovereignty. Hmm. Putting things down a bit and taking some time to say, what's my set of principles? What's my internal stance that's respectful and honoring of my unique expression in the world. Mm. And it doesn't matter whether 
I'm sitting inside of a very family or community oriented uh, system uh, in Africa, in Asia, in Australia, in the indigenous tribes everywhere in the world, or in a more individualistic culture. I'm the same person. And I have a responsibility to notice who am I with? How am I being with them? What is the way to be reciprocal in our self-ruling so that we can see each other fully and give permission for that full expression? So we can see each other. I'm, I'm just I'm just channeling um, Dumi, our colleague and friend with Ubuntu uh, yeah. and, and that, that greeting in um, Swahili of I see you, right? Uh, so, so how this concept applies to modern leadership, if at all? I think it does a lot. And it actually came out of my work with leaders and organizations who, mm. you know, we could go to both ends of the spectrum. The leaders who say, it's not my job to have people feel good, <laughs> have mm. harmony and be happy at work. It's all about results. Well, Okay. That's one thing it's about. And how happy are you, leader? Huh. And the work that they do individually to reclaim the sides of themselves that have heart and care and uh, a desire for their families to be safe is a place to touch into and realize, oh, hmm. The majority of waking hours are spent in the workplace. Maybe there is something for me to do around harmony and well-being in the workplace. On the other end, leaders who are very struck in that notion of care, um, uh, Sacha Nadella at Microsoft talks about model coach and care. Mm -hmm. And the care piece is what he recognized was missing in this highly competitive culture. And it would mean it was missing with clients. So there needed to be some rigor around care, but not lose the spirit of it. And the other example, to bring care in to balance what was a push to performance, but at the cost of relationships, which mm. shows up in attrition, it shows up in low engagement, it shows up in incivility. So really, I brought sovereignty forward as the way to encapsulate that full spectrum that when an individual leader can begin to recognize that responsibility they have, they see the organization, the enterprise and those relationships with a more systemic view. Mm -hmm. And I think this is going to be key for the next two decades as lots of things dissolve and something else emerges. Mm -hmm. So do you use this concept in your coaching when you work with leaders here? Yeah? All day long. <laughs> <laughs> We train coaches that way. We work with leaders that way. We um, help teams start to see what does team sovereignty look like? How do we how do we accept responsibility that we've been given a charge? And how will we work together in order to manifest that? And how do we find our voice to challenge what we've been told when our data tells us that that might not be the right strategy? Too many teams go to go to the end zone of their project and realize, Oh, this wasn't such a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so it's about building the confidence to be courageous and challenging assumptions every step of the way. That's really what executive leaders want from their teams. Mm -hmm. You know, that that's so interesting, the whole concept. I'm fascinated by it because for many, many years, um, at least in our hemisphere, the concept of leadership was focus on an individual, right? The hero's journey, all this good stuff. And, and here you're bringing much more systemic um, approach and, and a message of harmony and togetherness, community of sorts, rather than that individualistic, mind you could be perceived as slightly um, selfish. Do you, do you see that leaders are actually resonating with this concept or is it, is it a little bit of a hesitance if not, um, if not pushing back? So the thing that breaks down the resistance, which we have to remember comes from, uh, you know, Marshall Goldsmith's wonderful phrase, what got you here won't get you there. <laughs> um, so, so we have leaders with decades of experience and success in a, in a way of operating. However, the environment has changed 
mm. so dramatically and is changing at a level of pace and complexity. No one person anymore can be expert. The expert model is dying. Mm -hmm. It's epically out of date. Um, uh, Stephen Covey's uh, book, Trust and Inspire, that just came out. He's got a little quip in there. In 1983, human knowledge doubled every 13 years. Today, 12 hours. <laughs> 12 hours. So humbling, leaders, humbling, isn't it? Leaders who were attached to their expertise and their experience and their wisdom, hard won are going to find themselves out of date, un unable to grasp what's coming. And that's a hard thing to admit. Mm. The ones who can, and I think one of the ways we help them to do that is to help them give them, have them new eyes to see, mm -hmm. to see what's happening around them and look at it at a pattern level, rather than looking at the hard data. Is the data right or is the data wrong? What does the data suggest? What are some scenarios? What are some hypotheses? And the minute the imagination gets activated, the resistance to change starts to drop mm -hmm. because they have some certainty around constructing those scenarios. And then, of course, the ability to rationalize and objectify and, and examine kicks right back in and says, all right, we have six scenarios. Which one is most likely to satisfy customers, shareholders, um, innovation objectives, strategies for the workforce, and really help us compete within our market. We so often start there and work backwards instead of allowing ourselves to envision something and then say, ah, how do we fit into this? Mm -hmm. That's a fundamental shift in mindset. And I think when we activate imagination, we break down the resistance and it's amazing to see what emerges. And they're always surprised, like, how did the team get there? <laughs> <laughs> Since you've been working and you still do work with people uh, in all sorts of different countries, cultures, environments, businesses, you name it, do, do, do you see some patterns globally or is it more prevalent in some parts of, a, of the world than others? I, I think the generational patterns are more profound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I was, was wondering about that. I was working with a financial well, they don't call it that. They call it fintech in, uh, yeah. in India. And um, actually, this was a company in Sri Lanka, and uh, it was their women leadership uh, conference. And it was striking to me, 27 to 40 was about the age range. Mm -hmm. These were courageous women. They had wicked good questions for me well, this is what I see going on in the organization and that doesn't work. I don't want to emulate that leadership. I want to find my voice because I recognize that we have a different workforce coming. I don't remember being that wise at that age. <laughs> <laughs> so the fact that technology uh, combined with being connected around the globe, we have an accelerated uh, path of awareness building in the younger generations and their readiness to uh, challenge the status quo, to experiment mm -hmm. with something not yet done and to move in a learn fast. I know Agile talks about fail fast, but I prefer to say learn fast. They're experimenting, testing and doing a fast cycle of that so that they can see, ah, this is the thing that will transcend the change that's coming mm -hmm. because it's unique to us and our workforce and what we stand for. That's a systemic mindset. Yeah. And so the younger generations are able and ready. And it doesn't matter where I'm, I was talking in Russia and Ukraine a few months ago. Same thing, same phenomenon. In fact, the Ukrainian people are extraordinarily bright about systemic thinking. I'm very curious about where that came from. <laughs> Well, that leads me to another, I'll say, provocative um, hypothesis that, that you offered in your TEDx talk, mm -hmm. and it was about judgment. Mm -hmm. uh, how many times do you do, do we hear, oh, don't be judgmental, this is very judgmental of you, and, and you offer a very different opinion on that. So... 
The origin of that talk and why I chose that particular subject is that, uh, you know, I present physically different with a birthmark on my face. So I learned about people being judgmental Mm. out of their discomfort as a little girl. Mm. And so I think I have a I have a point of view about how destructive judgment can be. And I understand we we have um, in polite society, we say we're not going to be judgmental, but just try it. Just try being not judgmental when you're around somebody who annoys you. It's Mm -hmm. impossible. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Now, neurobiologically, uh, we're, we're wired this way, right? The limbic brain, the reticular activating system for the neuroscience geeks out there. Of course, we're, we're looking for what's safe. Uh, what will be, what will create pressure for me to not feel okay or feel whole in some way? The problem is we're not very good at calibrating. Mm. So we have early imprinted experiences as I did. And, and it has us looking for that experience all the time. I'm scanning, always looking for someone who's uncomfortable. The odd thing is I noticed parents were uncomfortable, but kids weren't uncomfortable. <laughs> they were curious. Curious, yes. You know, thank you, Ted Lasso. Be curious, not judgmental. I'd only say to Ted, let's look at it this way. If we could notice when we're being judgmental and then pause our habit response, Mm -hmm. we have the opportunity to listen a little more deeply and say, hmm, is it true? Is it a real threat? Am I really being personally attacked? Might this person be speaking about something that's true for them, but not true for me? Mm. What's here for me to learn from this person? So if I can notice, pause, name my discomfort and stay there a little longer, I can negotiate that relationship with curiosity and wonder. I can ask a question. When you were describing that situation, I could feel myself reacting to it. What? What's the impact on you um, when that happens? Yeah, I remember the work of Howard Ross on unconscious bias. And uh, he always said, you know, when you when you hear something that you you just have an innate reaction and not necessarily a positive one, it's like, okay, what am I saying that they don't hear or what am I not saying? So they can't understand, right? (laughs) And what, what is the frame? for the other person that we happen to be uh, n- not necessarily on the same page. So yeah, that's, I, I think that's, that's super important just to examine for ourselves, where, where is that reaction coming from and uh, seeking for more understanding and curiosity rather than, uh, as you said, the, the, uh, the reaction that it's more maybe ingrained in us because that's, yes. that's the norm, right? So you said something, though, that I want to pick up on, which is the flip side of the penny. Mm. So many people have, uh, at least in my generation, I was raised to look for role models, find a sponsor, find a mentor, someone who is behaving in a way that seems to produce success and learn to emulate their qualities and traits. The problem with this, at some point, it stops being useful because we're each uniquely constructed. Yeah. And if I, <clears throat> excuse me, if I put somebody on a pedestal and say, that's my, that's my definition of mastery or of success, I'm discarding what makes me unique. Mm. And at some point, I can't be them. So I stop being successful with this positive regard or positive judgment, as we would say. And that starts a journey of self-awareness. Well, what if we didn't have to do it that way? <laughs> what if we could help people recognize you are already possessing everything necessary to live a full and satisfying life? You just don't know it yet. So how do you learn to be curious with self? What is introspection? What is reflection? Mm. How do you get feedback in the spirit of wonder, not in the spirit of critique. And I think these are some evolutionary pieces that we're going to do a lot of work with over the next couple of decades in coaching. Yeah, you mentioned the curiosity in younger generations and and, and questioning, maybe not questioning, just challenging a little bit um, the status quo. I, I just participated in a 
fairly fascinating session around the dark side of empathy. Mm. You know, empathy is on everybody's vocabulary these days. And yes, it does have a dark side. <laughs> so, so this is that the balance and self-awareness seem to be um, of great importance. And, and I wanted to, um, speaking of judgment or no judgment, the title of your book is 2020 Year of No Return. <laughs> you don't know return. Little touch bit of judgment there, maybe. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and judgment in terms of discerning. Mm. Uh, I think it's important that we exercise judgment. When we make the word judgment have everything in it, including being judgmental, unconsciously behaving in a reactive way that is unproductive, we make the root. Uh, the enemy. And I think that's a problem. We mm -hmm. stop critical thinking. We don't allow space for people to say, hmm, you know, that choice we made a couple of weeks ago, I think we might have missed a couple of things that were going on, or we deflected or dismissed something that was important data, or we let, a, we let our faith and belief in something override our uh, rational realistic examination of what's really the condition we're trying mm -hmm. to make something happen in. Those are skills to mm -hmm. exercise judgment. And what I was noticing across 2020, and of course I wrote the book because we were doing a social progress conference. I, I could see that the pandemic had revealed a lot of cracks in our systems. Mm -hmm. The inability of our uh, governance structure to handle a global pandemic. And that was true everywhere, not just in America. Right. Yeah, so we did some pretty silly things, but we couldn't tell the truth about what was going on. That was the first crack, like, wow, <laughs> what happened to journalism? We don't get the facts anymore. And it's become a media show, it's entertainment as opposed to something that informs the citizenry. Mm -hmm. We weren't citizens anymore, we were consumers. And I think that's perpetuating. So people say capitalism is the is the enemy. And you know, you heard me say this in Miami. Um, Klaus Schwab from the World Economic Forum said, uh, "We're in the great reset of capitalism." And I think what he means by that is that what we value and therefore construct to create a human experience anywhere on the planet, this is what's transforming when we see the stark contrast whether we're thinking about um, uh, what people identify as wealth and prosperity, yeah. access to clean water and food. I mean, food security, insecurity, distribution. Um, my son works in uh, what causes crop yields to decline. And these are very important things in parts of the world that can't afford to have 40% of their crops fail. Mm. These are factors that are very complex and interconnected. We can see it now. When we were going about our lives before the pandemic, all was good. You get a job, you go to school, you get a job, you raise a family. Ugh. Wait a minute. I don't have all of that privilege access now. Mm -hmm. And it's not coming back. As if it was ever there. It was an illusion. So that's why I said the year of no return. We have a lot of thinking to do about what's the world we want to create now that we understand that there are things that are not, not working. Mm -hmm. From to money laundering to, you know, governmental systems that are not taking care of its citizenry. You just touched upon each of the E, S, and G. Um, <laughs> In, in, in that, and which, which is a great segue, you did mention the um, uh, the social progress conference, and you've been quite involved in the um, discussions um, uh, about creating that future world that really pays attention to social issues through coaching and otherwise. Mm -hmm. So... Um, and we see many, many coaches really uh, paying more attention. Uh, we at ICF ask in one of our surveys if, uh, if coaching can, in fact, progress uh, and support the, 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 the social issues. And majority of people responded yes to a significant level. Um, 
big conversation in the coaching world. Is it okay for a coach to bring the social agenda to the awareness of their clients? So where where, where do you land on all that right now? And we, we together been in a, in a big conversation with some big thinkers about the poly crisis term being used uh, on so many fronts that, that we, you know, either we like it or not, we are living in, let alone confronting. Yeah, no question. Um, I can't imagine that anybody listening to this at any point in time hasn't had a moment in the last two years when they have sat out in their backyard in a chair in the quiet thinking to themselves, will we survive? <laughs> <laughs> and in some ways, that's really where I think we need to begin. I want to go back to where you started, which is do coaches have permission? I'm quite puzzled by this question. Um, even before we change to the core competencies, but in the current core competencies, there are five skills that are explicitly giving not only permission, but ethical responsibility to be sensitive to, to consider, and to invite identity, context, culture, beliefs, values. These are essential for us to invite the client to share with us. Otherwise, we're not coaching the whole person and we're not being client-centered, we will get caught in our bias of what we think is right for the client, right? This is the value of coaching supervision is that we start to go, oh, <laughs> maybe I crossed a boundary there. The real travesty is if we don't ask, we are not going to have us talking about the things that most matter to this person and their social progress in their own lives. And if we can't help our clients take responsibility, this is back to the principle of sovereignty, to rule their own lives in a respectful and honoring way, they don't have a hope or a prayer of seeing the people that are in their lives in that way and choose to engage in a way that is respectful and honoring. We need to restore our ability to speak about these things. And that's social progress. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that the, the most recent update to the um, not only competencies, but also to the ICF code of ethics, mm -hmm. with that standard specifically, specifically saying that the coach and the client need to be aware of the impact of their work on the greater society is, is another uh, very strong signal that what you're talking about is not only um, permitted, but required. Yeah, you know, expected, like, required. Expected, required. Yeah. This is um, the Corporate Social Impact Institute uh, published something many years ago called the Social Mindset. And unfortunately, I think it was only read by geeks in philanthropy. <laughs> <laughs> but the good news is, I think it's starting to get some daylight with uh, folks who run really big organizations to understand that if they fail to anticipate the impact of their decisions on society as a whole, right. they're going to get caught like they've got their hand in a cookie jar and they've made a big mistake. Mm. And you can see it in the news when you look at organizations that are taking a stance. Delta Airlines, you and I fly on them a lot, and I've appreciated for many years their commitment to fighting human trafficking. Yes. This is an example of without needing an ESG goal, they and their conscience said, we know our industry causes some of this to perpetuate. Mm -hmm. We have a responsibility to society to contribute to mitigate this, if not eliminate it altogether. And they've never wavered in their commitment to it. So I think every organizational leader has this in them. If we don't ask about it, they're not only going to miss out on the opportunity to do something their workforce cares deeply about and they have impact in their in their uh, communities with, mm -hmm. but we're also going to continue to perpetuate something that they could really fix. Yeah, you know, that's that's exactly the, the opportunity cost that could should never be um, neglected or ignored because we do have an impact. I'm watching time. I, I could be talking to you for days. Um, uh, and I'm sure that our our viewers are feeling the same way, but we are coming to the end of our of our time. Uh, so invitechange.com, right? 
uh, right. that's the that's the uh, please do visit the the, uh, the website you can find also the link to Janet's talk, TED talk and also to Janet's book uh, not to mention several other offerings that the organization has in there and um, what I would like to also pay uh, uh, get your attention to is that ICF just issued the um, the annual report for 2021 called Elevate, and this is amazing that during such a such a difficult times, the coaching profession is growing leaps and bounds. ICF, on your behalf, is is trying to do absolute best in promoting coaching, applying coaching where it can set, certainly. And I'm channeling our common friend Morel, um, uh, uh, accelerate and amplify um, the impact. So, so uh, Janet, before we part ways, any, any um, piece of advice to our viewers? And I don't care where it lands, coaching, not coaching. <laughs> what, what would you like to leave our, our viewers and listeners with today? You know, I've been contemplating a lot Jane Goodall's latest book, uh, Book of Hope. And I know a lot of people think that hope is a fantasy, wishful thinking kind of word. I don't. I think it's our responsibility to command hope when hope is about action and engagement. And uh, if we want to have a thriving life, it takes every one of us choosing that stance to be in action and engagement. That's what builds hope in our society and in our communities and in our families and in our own hearts. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for that um, uplifting uh, comment to end our conversation. Thank you so much for, for joining us today. And uh, um, next live stream, uh, uh, September 29th, 11 o'clock Eastern Daylight Time. I hope you joined us again for that conversation. And uh, Janet, can't, can't thank you enough for, for being our guest today. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Bye. Bye, everybody.